don't do titles because I have learned that it doesn't matter what a person says before your name. It matters what they say after your name. You got to forgive me. I'm ready to preach now. I said, I'm ready to preach now. Oh, I got you too. Oh, we about to have some fun up in here, up in here. Good morning, Alfred Street. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. For truly the joy of the Lord is ours. We thank God for your presence here on this Sunday morning. I will have to admit to you, for those of you who stayed over for the 7.30 and here at 9.30, my church begins at 10. I used to wake up at 8 o'clock because your first service was at 8 o'clock, but y'all done got too big now, and I ain't waking up at 7.30, so I, I, I just watch you on demand. But I used to wake up at 8 o'clock, but now I don't have to wake up now until 9.00. So that 7.30 service was a little early for the brother. So um, I had to get warm up. I think I'm warm right now. Amen. And I come to praise God and give God praise for all of his bountiful blessings. Amen. And if you know that God has been good to you, you know that God woke you up this morning. If you know that God started your work and you didn't let no rain stop you from coming to the house of the Lord and you come to give God praise on this Sunday morning. I feel it right now. I know we got, we're going to ride out with me this morning now because God has been good and mighty, mighty good to us. And we just come to give him praise because he's Lord over our lives. Yeah! Amen. Remember when I saw that saint with that Michigan State shirt on? That... You done, you done gave me power from on high, amen. You done gave me power from on high. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me thank God again for this honor and this humble privilege to stand behind this sacred desk, a desk that I have been watching on live stream, on Facebook, on demand, for the last 10 years. The psalmist said that the, the good steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. And the steps, rather, of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he is delighteth in thy way. Uh, God, again, as I said earlier, and I, uh, has ordered our steps. And God places people in your lives for a season, and then God puts people in your lives for your destiny. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God put one Howard John Wesley in my life, not for a season, not just for that field experience somewhere in the backwoods of Durham, North Carolina. <laughs> I know that God put Howard John Wesley in my life as part of my destiny. Over that mentorship, He became, and he didn't know that then, uh, my idol. Uh, our, our souls touched based upon the spirit of the Holy Ghost at that time. And even though we went to two schools that compete against each other and who don't like each other at all, uh, our, our chapters, however, pledged together. And that is how we be, have become great friends and remain good friends. I do remind him that we have seven national championships, and they only have five. Uh, and so when he comes up to seven, he can start talking a little bit more junk. But until that time, we're still on top. Amen. So to all of my Tar Heels, we welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank God for you being here. Amen. I told the 730 crowd that that Friday morning, I, I packed my Carolina blue and white robe. I knew we would be playing today. Oops. So I had to go back and put on my morning outfit, amen? So I had to put on all this black. I, I, I don't know if Eugene and Dwayne are here as members of our fraternity from North Carolina. If you are, stand up. I certainly want to recognize you all and thank you all. Hey, Dwayne, God bless you for being here. I didn't know if Eugene made it this morning, but God bless you. Your wife and family were in here earlier this morning. To Pastor Judy, to the other cadre of clerics here assembled, to your deacons, and to all of you who love my Christ. Again, we greet you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To those of you who have had the pleasure and honor of sojourning with to Israel, especially to bus four, which was the best bus 
which was all bus four people standing. Y'all got some bus four people, just y'all a few y'all. Hey babies, how y'all doing? Hey, how y'all doing? So good to see you all. I will forever cherish those memories for the rest of my life. Amen? Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with us to John chapter 9 as we continue our series on belief. Uh, your pastor has given us an assignment um, to preach out of chapter 9. And so I want to be obedient to the theme for this month, be obedient to what he has asked us to do. For those of you, as I said, at the 730 service who were here when um, John Adolph preached on Tuesday night, uh, y'all can leave right now. Uh, I kind of cringed as I was watching it. I think he came from John 9 about that other blind man. And I was like, oh, my God, we got to talk about the same thing. And I am no John Adolph, amen. He is somebody's preacher. So I, I pray that you grade me on the curve um, if you were here Tuesday night. Uh, all light-skinned preachers need to be graded on the curve um, in their own high, amen. Um, and, but I, I think, Brother Organist, we, if the Holy Spirit has his way, let's have his way this morning. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 7, coming out of the King James Version of our Bible. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And the disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither had this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground. Somebody say spat. Spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And said unto him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. If you would go right back to verse 6 for me, my brothers and sisters up in your media booth. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay when he had spoken he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay when when when, when he had thus spoken he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. I want to talk this 930 service about when ministry gets messy. When ministry gets messy. You may take your seats in the presence of our Lord. Uh, now they told me that the 930 crowd is the amen crowd. That the, the, that the 930 crowd will help the preacher preach. Amen. And, and, and if your neighbor has not smiled, if your neighbor has not said a word, don't touch them, but slap them and say, say amen. amen. Uh, your, your pastor told you all that I am in the funeral business. Um, before I caught a flight, we had four funerals on yesterday. And I don't plan to come in no church on Sunday morning and be have another funeral and deal with dead folk. Amen. But the Bible says that if you got breath in your body, amen, that everything that had breath in your body, and if you woke up this morning, you ought to praise the Lord, amen? So I expect you all to help this preacher this Sunday morning when ministry gets messy. Let me begin as I began at 7.30 by reminding you that there are at least four different blind men in the Bible. We meet the first one in Mark chapter 8. We meet another one in Mark 10. We meet one in Matthew 9. 
We meet another two in Matthew 20. We meet one in Luke 18. And here's this blind man again in John 9. There are at least four different blind men in the Bible. It's imperative for us to understand this context so that you understand that this blind man in John chapter 9 is not the famous blind Bartimaeus. If you ever would have to do biblical trivia, most of you only know about blind Bartimaeus. But there are, again, at least four different blind men that Jesus heals in the Bible. Now, I told the 730 crowd that I, I love the Luke story, and I love how Luke gives the story in Luke 18. Luke, like myself, was a trained historian. Unlike the other gospel writers, Luke will give us more detail than any other gospel writers. Luke paints the picture well so you understand and you see everything that is going on in the text and what happened during the days of Jesus. Luke tells us that this man was just sitting by the road roadside and he hears a parade coming down the street and anyone knows that if you lose one sense your other senses become heightened my, my great-grandfather who founded our funeral home in 1932 was blind half of his life he he was blind half of his life but because he lost his sight he began to encourage and help his other senses and he would know a person just by their voice he didn't have to know your name he didn't have to have to have to have seen you but if he he could know your name by your voice. He would remember if you spoke again who you were, even though he could not see you. And so this man has a heightened sense. And so he hears that something is going on. People are making noise. And that's why I like noisy churches, because when people make noise, something is about to happen. When people get excited that God is in the neighborhood, something is about to happen. And other people like your neighbor told him to be quiet. Yesterday at the 6 o'clock service, I kind of yelled out because I'm a little Pentecostal, and I kind of yelled out the lady in front of me. Didn't, I think I hurt her ears. But the Bible says that he cried out because he knew Jesus was in the midst. Now, what is interesting is this man was blind, but he knew Jesus was there. He's blind, but he knows Jesus is there. He can't see but he has a feeling that somebody special is around the area. And he asked, what is going on? And obviously he said somebody told him that it was Jesus. Now there wasn't no Facebook back then. There wasn't no Twitter back then. There wasn't no social media back then. Somehow this man had heard all about Jesus and that he had miracle hands and that he had power just in his tongue. Somebody else had told somebody what he had done, that he maybe had took two fish and five hush puppies and and created a seafood buffet in the hills of Herman. Maybe somebody told him that he made an ABC store at a wedding in Cana. Somebody told him what the man can do. So can I poll and ask you a question? Have you ever told anybody what the Lord has done in your life? Have you ever told anybody what miracles God has done in your life? Has anybody ever passed by your house and said that there's something going on up in here, up in here? Have you ever been a witness? Oh, my Lord. And he says, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. He says, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. As I told the 730 crowd, I recognize he ain't say, Reverend Doctor, Apostle, bishop, prophet, prophetess, chief prelate, and the one I don't understand, bishop elect. Why you just don't wait till you become bishop? What the world is bishop elect? And, and, and. And that's why, I, I, you know, he called me all my, my titles and I resume, but I, I don't do titles because I have learned that it doesn't matter what a person says before your name. It matters what they say after your name. 
It's not matter all your titles and all your degrees, all your commas behind your name do not matter, especially when you come into the house of the Lord and talking about my Savior. That's why everybody in my congregation and everybody on bus for knew just to call me Chris because this man in the Bible just says, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. The power didn't come before his name. The power came after his name. When he called him the Messiah, asked him to have passion and said, will you have me? And Jesus asked, what do you want? And the man says, I want to see. The man speaks with specificity. He says, I want to see. And it's interesting that you got to understand the context of chapter 9. You cannot understand the miracle in chapter 9 without understanding the teachings that happens in chapter 8. In chapter 8. It begins with him coming out of the Mount of Olives. In chapter 8, they bring to him that woman that is caught in the act of adultery. In the act. How do the men of God catch a woman in the act? Pause and for station identification. How do they catch her in the act? Did they go to act themselves and find herself already occupied and, and hate on this woman? And then they bring her before Jesus and says, the law of Moses says she is to be stoned to death, but where it saith thou? And he says, ye without sin cast the first stone. And you know the rest of the story. They all left. Because all of us up in here, up in here are sinners saved by grace. I said, all of us up in here have come short of the glory of God, and none of us has the right nor the power to cast any stone. And so they left her. And after leaving her, Jesus then teaches her. I love my Savior, Mark. As I told you before, I've been I love my Savior. He, he never corrects people, never embarrasses people, never castigates people in front of other people. We like to put people's business on front street. We like to post about them. We like to talk about them. We like to embarrass them. We like to tell everybody else about them. We like to get on the phone and tell what we had had heard. But watch our Savior and how he handles people in their sin. He made sure that nobody was around when he had his compassion on her and his correction. The compassion on her is that she sent his, her accusers away. And he says, go forth and live. That's the compassion. But the correction is, don't you do it no more. So you got to understand it's both and, not one or the other. There's some people that just want to talk about compassion. God wants you to do anything you want to do, and he will forgive you. But you got to understand there's also some correction for your bad behaviors. He says, go forth and sin no more. It's the compassion and the correction of the Christ that makes us who we are. That woman he found at Jacob's well. He sent his men into the city to leave him alone just so he could be with her by himself. And he has that conversation with that woman at the well, and he asks, where your husband at? She says, I ain't got no husband. I know I got degrees, but that sounds better. I, I ain't got no husband. He says, I know you ain't got no husband. And the one you're living with now ain't your husband either. But that was the sixth man she was shacking up with. But she got chained when the seventh man showed up. Anybody know about the seventh man? Anybody know about the seventh man? Anybody know about the seventh man? The perfect man showed up, Mark. And when the seventh man showed up, he changed her life. And after allowing this woman to go free, the Pharisees get upset because he did not follow Moses' law. And he has to then teach them that I am really the law. I am the light of the world. And I have come so that you might get out of your darkness and have light. In chapter 8, Howard, he says, I am the light. I am the light. 
I have come so you can come out of your darkness and live in light. That's why I don't understand these new wave churches, these dark churches that look like clubs. With the spotlight on the preacher and the smoke in the mirrors. I, I don't understand why they have cut off the lights if the person we're supposed to be emulating, supposed to be following, says, I am the light of the world. Why y'all don't turn off the lights? He says, I am the light of the world. And so the Pharisees say, you, 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 you're self-prophesizing. You, 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 you're self-making yourself like a god. And he tells them, when, when you almost, when, when you've seen me, you've seen God. For I am the light. I, I am he who has been sent to bring light to a dark area. And chapter 8 ends with them trying to stone him to death. Like they tried to stone the woman caught in the issue of blood. And then chapter 9 begins with he passed by. And after that, they bring this man who was blind from birth to him. And the Bible says that this man had been blind from birth and could not see. And Jesus asked, what do you want me to do for you? And he speaks again with specificity and he says, I want to see. And the Bible says that he then went down on the ground. He spit in the ground, took his saliva, mixed it up with some dirt and made clay out of it. The Bible says he spit in the ground and he made clay and put it over the man's eyes. Don't you miss that? He spit in the ground, made clay and put it in the man's eye. For those of you who might remember back in your ratchet days, do you remember the second to last season of Flavor of Love? I know you're saved and sanctified now. Don't you act all bougie on me up in here. Do you remember in the second to last season of Flavor of Love where there were three last contestants, New York, Pumpkin, and Hoops? Lord Jesus, whatever happened to Hoops? And in the second to last season, New York spits. Well, I got a few people nodding their head. They don't want you to know they ratchet. She, she spits in Pumpkin's face and they start to fight. There is nothing worse in the world, nothing more degrading and dehumanizing in the world than the someone to spit in your face. Last week, if you read the news, there was a manager at the Arby's store, a customer spit in her face at the Arby's. She ran this man down and killed him for spitting in her face. There is nothing worse than spitting in someone's face. And that's what the Bible says happened, that he spit in the ground, put the spit in the man's face, and watch what happens. So why does Jesus spit? Well, my brothers and my sisters, again, ministry gets messy sometimes. All of us who are leaders in this church, you understand especially us pastors understand that ministry gets messy because people are messy. Some years ago, some years ago, I got an a, a email from our lead deaconess. We don't use chairman and president. We don't, in, our, in our church, you are either a facilitator or coordinator. We don't, you ain't going to die as chairman of the deacon board at our church. That, 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 that's saying, that's saying, and you got tenure too, four years, four years, and get on, all right? Uh, because you ain't going to create your own little kingdom in our church. I mean, it ain't but one kingdom, that's the Lord's kingdom. And, and so I got, this, I got this nasty email, Howard, from my lead deaconess telling me and was upset that uh, the security had told her she couldn't park in her reserved parking space no more. So my reply to her was, where is your reserved <laughs> parking space? She had done went and bought her a cone. and decided that this was going to be her space. And all every now and then, and a whole lot of times, us pastors have got to clean up mess that we ain't create. 
Because we're dealing with messy people, and messy people create mess. And sometimes you've got to make stuff a little bit more messier to clean it up. Anytime you even get bounty, when you push bounty, when you push the water away, it moves out a little bit further. And every time we've got to clean up people's mess that we ain't even create. So don't be ashamed. Don't be shocked when in your ministry when mess happens. That's just part of the process. And sometimes it just takes some mess to happen so people might get blessed. And so he spits in the ground and makes clay. He spits because Jesus understands the power of water. Saliva so is water. And water also symbolizes birth. That when you are in your mother's womb, you are comforted, you are cushioned, and you live off of your mother's water. And a mother knows that she's about to give birth because the first thing that happens is that her water breaks. Water is the median for life. And when he puts his spit in the man's eye, he symbolically gives this man new life. Help me, somebody. When he spits in the ground, he symbolically gives this man new life, and he creates a new life for this man. But he has to make clay because he realized that it is clay that which has made us. And see, over life's journey, your clay is going to fall apart. I said over time's life, your clay is going to fall apart. You saw that picture of Howard and me in 1993, full head of hair, slim, a little slimmer. Uh, Your your, your flesh is going to fall apart. And there's some witnesses up in here. You don't want to be too shamed. That ain't your hair you got on right now. No how. Your flesh is going to fall apart. Your flesh is going to decay. You're going to have to take some pills. You're going to have to get some therapy. You're going to have to get a doctor. You're going to have to get a chiropractor to keep your flesh up. And so the doctor by the name of Jesus stops by and gives this man more flesh. Some observers believe that the man didn't even have eyes marked in his eye sockets. And what Jesus was actually doing was give the man something he didn't even have. And I don't know, I should have a few witnesses up in here who ain't ashamed to say you living your best life right now. That God has given you some things right now. You're living a life right now you never thought you would ever live. And somebody don't mind giving God praise and giving God glory that he's given you something you thought you would never have and you ain't shamed to give God glory and give him praise that he's giving you new life. And then they said, the man that healed you is demon possessed. And that man says, I don't know who he is. Only thing I know is that before I met him, I couldn't see You can say what you want to say. I know you're upset that he saved me and he delivered me on the Sabbath. And y'all don't believe in y'all little rules and your little books that anything supposed to happen on the Sabbath. I know y'all claim he's a sinner and he ain't who he says he is and he's demon possessed. But there's one thing I know. I couldn't see. But now I can see. I know we're not supposed to call him the Messiah, and that's fine. I ain't got to call him what you don't want me to call him. But one thing I do know is that I couldn't see. But now I can see. I said, I I don't care. I don't care what your law says. I don't care what your rules say. I don't care if they tell me not to be quiet. I don't care if nobody on my road ain't saying nothing. I know God has been good to me. I know God has saved me. I know God has delivered me. And I didn't get up this Sunday morning to come sit on a lump like a log. I came in this rain to give God praise because God has been good to me. He gave me what I didn't have. And I want to say thank you. Anybody got thanks on their hearts? Anybody got thanks in their lips? And that man gave John Newton that line to amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm fine. I'm blind, but now I see. Anybody know it because of his grace? 
Anybody know it's because of his grace? His grace woke me up this morning. His grace started me on my way. His grace put food on the table. His grace put clothes on the table in my closet. His grace put gas in my car. His grace got me to church this morning. His grace allowed me to graduate from school. His grace paid off my student loans. His grace built the Smithsonian African American History Museum. His grace is keeping me right now. I want to know if I have a witness up in Alfred Street this Sunday morning that can thank God for his grace that his grace saved you his grace is keeping you his grace is all right anybody know it's all right anybody know it's all right say yes if you know it's all right hallelujah 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 won't he do it every time time. Won't he make a way? Won't he save your life? Won't he deliver you? Won't he give you new life? If you've got new life because of Jesus, give God praise. If you've got new life because it's been good, give him praise. If you want to thank the Lord right now, say yes. Say yes.